Good morning, family. I am really excited um, just to be sharing a word that I feel God has placed on my heart that is very, very applicable to where we are as a church and where we are as a family. And it's something that I've been thinking about over the past few weeks. And God has I've just been unpacking it with God. And I'm really excited because it's actually titled um, The Family Table. And that's something that's very, very dear and near to my heart. But as I was... Um, Looking into this, this, two weeks ago, I heard this phrase that just really jumped out at me and caught me off guard. And oftentimes we hear that Jesus ate with his disciples and Jesus you know, ministered and he went around with his disciples and that we are to be his disciples, which is absolutely true. But that word really, we don't use it apart from within a church, disciples, we don't really use in our everyday environment. And then I was listening to something online and they referred to us as apprentices. And I love that. We're all kind of, we have an apprenticeship with Jesus. And so if you're our apprentice of Jesus, um, a follower and a disciple, which is the same as a disciple, what does that mean? An apprentice is someone who follows the ways of their master. And so oftentimes, you know, if you're, a, if you're building in the building industry or you're a carpenter, um, so you have the master carpenter who's your teacher. And so then as an apprentice, you learn from him, you watch him, you emulate him, you copy him and you learn from him. And that is what we as Christians are supposed to do. As disciples and as followers of Jesus, we are to emulate him and be his apprentices. So I just love that. That really just changed the way I kind of saw things. And so it kind of got me on a, on a bit of a journey that if we are his apprentices, what I need to look at is what did Jesus do that I am to copy and emulate? And so there's lots of different things. There's things like prayer and um, worship and there's things like you know solitude and silence. Jesus did that. And there's also another one that's really important is as I started going through some of the Gospels, one thing that I saw um, Jesus do, do over and over and over again is actually share a meal. And I love that because, um, you know, I think if I was Jesus and I knew that I was only going to have ministry for this short amount of time, you know, that he would be go, go teaching at the synagogues. And yet he, most of his ministry was done around a table, around a family table, around a meal. So there was lots of eating and drinking. I mean, his first um, miracle made in public was changing the water into wine at a wedding. So there he is celebrating. And so there's this wonderful humanness to Jesus. And so I'm thinking, well, if that's what he did, maybe this is something that we can learn from. And so this morning, we're going to be later on looking at Acts chapter 2. So I will put it on the screen, but also if you have your Bibles, feel free to open up to that. So one practice that the church, that especially the early church, um, we see is that eating was one of their core values. Eating and spending time was part of, part of the original core value of the church. And so in, if we look at Acts chapter 2, let's go and read that together. Acts chapter 2, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, the apprentices. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so back in those days, we know that if you want something to stick, there was no highlighters, but if you wanted, you know, they didn't have bold text. Like now we just type something out and we just put a bold text and we underline it and we highlight that. Um, back in um, when these letters were written, there was no way of conveying that boldness. And yet one thing that we see in this passage is that three times in those short verses, three times it speaks about them breaking bread together and being in communion and having meal together. And so, we, you know, we see it's the breaking of bread um, and then in the last um, 47, it says they broke bread and ate together. So as I was then going through Luke, and I just picked out, you know, let's have a look at Luke. There's all these instances where Jesus actually um, had a meal. And so I'll just quickly go through some of them. So you go Luke 5, where Jesus eats with tax collectors and sinners in the home of Levi. And, you know, that was one of the things that the Pharisees actually um, were upset with Jesus, that he was eating with tax collectors and that he was eating with sinners. If it was just a one-off event, they probably wouldn't have highlighted that. But obviously this was a common practice. This was something that he was doing regularly that, you know, it started to irritate them, that it was angering um, 
yeah, the Pharisees. So that's Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 7, Jesus is anointed in the home of Simon the Pharisee during when? During a meal. He's eating again with these people. Um, Luke, Luke 9, Jesus feeds the 5,000. Once again, over a meal, they're eating together and they're fellowshipping. Luke 10, Jesus eats dinner in the home of Mary and Martha. Luke 19, Jesus invites himself now to the Luke, um, sorry, Jesus invites himself to, the, to Zacchaeus' home. So he sees Zacchaeus, hey, I'm going to your house. I'm going to spend time with you. I'm going to stay overnight. We're having a meal together. So we see this happening again. Luke 22, Jesus and the la has hit the last supper with his disciples. Once again, the Passover meal, it's over a meal. He's eating and drinking with these people. And then after his resurrection, he's on, um, Luke 24, he's on the road to Emmaus and he encounters two of his disciples and they actually sit and eat together. And then he unpacks um, who he is. And so then they rush off to tell the other disciples and then all of a sudden they're in the room and he reveals himself once again and he begins to eat fish with his disciples. So we, we get to see from the life of Jesus um, all the way through to all the, all the letters that Paul wrote, that many times they're eating and they're fellowship around a table. And so the church grows, not from synagogue to synagogue, the church grows from home to home, from table to table, and from a hundred to hundreds and thousands. And all of a sudden this thing explodes. And it's not because they were in this amazing building. No, they were in homes sharing and then in the third century, um, you know, it was estimated that half the population became Christians. And then under Constantine, things begin to change. But one thing we do know, that the home and the table were the core central part, the original architecture of the church. So I'm not saying whether this is good or bad. Um, this is just the way that it started. And oftentimes we need to go back to the beginning to have a look, Lord, what did you want us to do? You know, if we are your, your apprentice, how do I do this? And so we, we've been looking. So I believe that there are four stages in history and we can actually see that in the architecture of the church. And so we're going to look, I'll briefly go over that and I want to have a look at that. So stage, stage one, it says... They were in homes, and this is what we read in Acts and in the early church for the first two, three centuries up to probably the fourth centuries, the church is in a home. And part of the reason why they were in a home was because um, they were being persecuted. So at the time, they built no buildings. There was no building program. They just did this in their homes. And the, and the center was the table. The meal was the center. And then as, and if you can have a look, I've just put on this photo, if we were to say, what does a church, what does your church look like? Oftentimes we'll display, you know, if on a lot, especially on a lot of Facebook pages and a lot of um, websites, you know, what's happening on the stage, this is what the church is like. And yet in the catacombs, which is where the, ch the church was hidden for many years in the first few centuries, this is a photo of what church was like. And the, f the photo is of a table with some food and people seated around it. And that was what the church was like. And then under Constantine, you know, um, the church is no longer in hiding and um, all of a sudden cathedrals are being erected. And so the next stage is that we, this stage, which is the church, the stage is the cathedral and the center is the altar. And so now we have this huge, and this is actually Westminster Abbey that you can see in Westminster Abbey. So it's actually in the shape of a cross. And at the very center is where you have the altar. But that altar was only for the priests or the bishops. And so all of a sudden, um, people, and so this meal that was once shared around a table is now changed and it just becomes a piece, uh, um, some wine and a piece of bread. And that's only for the priests and the bishops to take. And so during that time, there's very little understanding and the participation of the, of the rest of the church is virtually non-existent because most of the mass and most of the sermons are in Latin, which people don't understand. And so they attend out of ritual. And so a lot gets lost until the Reformation and the Reformation comes and praise God for the reformers. Yeah, that's where we're from. And during the reformers, you have men like Martin Luther. This is during the 16th century. And you have men like Martin Luther and John Calvin and John Knox. And these men said, hey, it's not fair that people don't understand. 
um, that people are unaware of what is being taught and, and preached. And hold on, this communion shouldn't, and this meal shouldn't be just for the, for the priest. It should be the word of God says for everyone to partake in, to remember what he has done. And so all of a sudden the church changes to a colonial style. And so the colonial style is just this pretty much a rectangular box Oftentimes they had steeples. You see them a lot, especially in America. There's a lot of these style of um, churches. And then the main focus is the pulpit. So the pulpit becomes where the, the, where the pastor or the priest would actually preach from. And in, as you can see in this photo, oftentimes there were these elaborate boxes. But part of that was because people could then start, they couldn't read, they couldn't write. But for the first time, the word of God is being spoken in English and being preached in German and in Swiss and so in all these other languages. And so all of a sudden these men are coming alive because they're hearing the word of God, but they're focusing on the pulpit is the main focus. And eventually comes a printing press, people like Tyndall and they've, um, you know, they, um, the Bible gets translated and it gets into the hands of people. And then all of a sudden at the turn of the century, the architecture of the church changes once again. And so at the turn of this century, people start going out for entertaining. The radio comes out, the theatres come out, radio and TV, and all of a sudden music becomes different. And so our churches change to this, to a theatre style and the stage is the main centre of it. And so the theatre style is, and even some of the older churches, all of a sudden, you know, we had this theatre style seating where um, they were slanted, um, a lot of the, even the older churches that you see around. But once again, then there was a choir set up, wasn't there? There was a massive choir. There was a pipe organ. And to us, that's old fashioned. But that was only in the last hundred years or so that the choir and the, the organ became the center focal point. And in time, that has changed because we haven't really changed our style, but it has changed now to a worship team or a worship band and our main focus is that and so then a preacher will come on with a we don't even have a pulpit anymore we just grab you know a table or something that we kind of just move in and out of its place but and I'm not saying either is I'm not saying that this is bad because this is how we've changed over time and this is what we are used to but I still can't help but believe that the original architecture of the church was around a table and a home and so I want to just unpack that a little bit today um, and let's have a look um, into that. The first thing was that even if you look in the New Testament, what are, how are we referred to? You know that it's only three times in the New Testament that we are referred to as Christians. Only three times. 268 times we are referred to as disciples or apprentices, as I like to be known now. And... Um, and over 350 times that we are referred to as brothers, sisters, or brethren, if you have the new, King, the old King James, brethren. Um, but that is how we are referred to. And so in essence, we are family. And we see that the early church understood that concept so much better than us. And communion was actually a meal. They sat and partake, partook in it. It was not, a, it says, oh, um, it tells us to eat and drink, not taste and sip which is kind of what it's become. Um, now, I'm not against communion. We do this every fortnight here. We just did it this morning. But I just wanted to, ask, to unpack this a little bit and start to think, okay, what should we do as apprentices of Jesus? What should our life start looking like? And so, you know, I've had many people who, and I've had conversations with people, well, maybe we need to get rid of this. If this is not what God intended, let's get rid of it. You know, what's the whole Sunday service and the worship together? Do we really need it? Why don't we just have church at home? I believe God's heart is because this is what we are used to and this is what our society um, is used to as well. That I don't believe God wants us to get rid of it, but rather that it's not either or, but both. And so, even if we go back to that very first, to that very first scripture, it says, "Every day they continued to meet together at the temple." So every day they be, they began to meet together at the temple, and then at the temple, what did they do? They probably worshipped. They um, they listened to the teaching, and then it says. They met in homes. So first they were at the temple. So I believe the temple is kind of what we do Sunday morning. This is our temple. So we, we meet together at the temple to worship, to, um, to hear the word of God, to grow in encouragement. And then they went and broke bread in their homes and ate together. 
And it says, if we do that, if we do both, not either or, but if we do both, it says the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. Isn't that our heart, that God will add to our number daily? But having a Sunday event is not enough. And so what does it look like um, having it in our homes? You know, I, really, I really feel that that is something that we have lost, where... The Sunday event, the Sunday service is great. We get ex energised, we get excited about it. But have we lost sight of one of the very vital roles that Jesus, um, one of the very vital practices that Jesus did, which was sharing a meal? There was something so powerful in sharing a meal with someone. You know, we've lost that ability to be hospitable and to allow people into our little space. There's a great quote. It's by um, someone called Leonard, Leonard Sweet, and it says, An untabled faith is an unstable faith. A neglect of the table in our churches is echoed on our families and communities. How great is that? So is your faith unstable because it's untabled? Who is around your table? Who are you influencing? Who are you sharing life with? And the neglect of doing this in our churches is actually shown. It's echoed in our families and in our communities. You know, there are many medical journals um, that speak about the importance of ha eating together. And they say that most kids that eat together as a family, they do so much better in life. There's less, um, there's less obesity, they, they do better academically, there's less stress and they have better relationships with their parents, those who eat more often around the table. And counsellors say, we know the solution's really easy to all of this. Eat together as a family. Eat around a table. The problem is that most families nowadays spend just as much money on takeaway as they do on their weekly grocery bill. And I know that happens sometimes in our family where, you know, it's just quickly, let's just grab something, you know, and we're eating on the run. Um, they say most parents, many parents and most parents don't even know how to cook. You know, we're like, what can be quick? What can be done within a few minutes? They say that one out of every five meals are being eaten in cars. Have you ever eaten in a car? I have. <laughs> um, in the 1960s, they said it used to take, on average, uh, um, an average family would sit around the dinner table. The average time it took for the meal, the evening meal, was an hour. Guess what it is today? 12 minutes. And half of those 12 minutes, half of those families that meet for the 12-minute meal is actually half of them doing it in front of the TV. I mean, it's just astounding, isn't it, that how far have we, how much have we lost during that time? And so now they, you know, um, 45%, there's a 45% decline in hospitality. And so, you know, I know, think back, when was the last time you had someone over? When was the last time you had family or friends gather in your home? When was the last time um, a non-believer was, you had dinner with them? You know, some people say it's been months, if not even longer. Um, so I do believe that if we open up our homes, that, you know, do I believe that the church has the answer for, for the, the needs of our community? Yes. And part of the answer is opening up our homes and opening up our tables to each other. You know, not only we looked at the architecture of the church, but, you know, even the, the design of our homes have changed to to actually, so we have everything going against us. Yeah, so here we are trying to be the apprentice of Jesus and trying to have meals with people, and yet everything is going against us. And I believe that the enemy knows this, and that's why he's, you know, changing um, that book that was by Leonard. I love it. The title of his book was From Table to Tablet. Has that happened in your family? That it was, we used to meet around a table, and now everyone's on their tablet. Happens, you know, happens in our family. And, um, if we look at even the design of our families, like, do you remember the house that I grew up in um, and most of the houses back in the 50s and 60s and 30s and even up, you know, even up to the 70s, even possibly I think even up to the 80s, it was most of the lounge room was actually at the front of the house. So I don't know if you remember, there was a sitting room or the living room and that was the front of the house. So, you know, there was a porch at the front where people used to sit and you could actually, you could tell who was home because their lights were on. Yeah, so you could tell, well, those people are home. And so straight after that was the dining room. In our house, you had the, the sitting room or the lounge room, the living room. Then there was a dining room and then the kitchen. And, so, and then the bedrooms were down the back. And yet now we've flipped everything. And so our, the veranda and the, the living rooms are now at the back. And we've, um, we've changed it um, to decks 
to entertainment areas at the back. And yet you can go past any modern street now and you will not know who's home because the lights aren't on at the front. There's no welcome. Hey, come, open up the front door. You know, everyone's kind of doing life secretly at the back. And yet, so we've changed this, um, the lounge room with, um, or the, the, the living room with the little dining room table and the coffee table has now replaced by a console table. And yet it's just um, and an entertainment room at the back, which is really just to entertain ourselves, not anyone else. And so it's really sad. But if we are Jesus' um, disciples and his apprentices, then we have to start practicing this. And I know hospitality is not easy for a lot of people. You know, I know it's some people get stressed out by it, but it doesn't have to be difficult. It could be as, as easy as going, you know what, I'm just going to meet up, maybe not in my home, let's meet up for coffee. You know, let's just put some crackers and dips out. Let's just have coffee and muffins. It doesn't have to be a meal, but we need to start um, working and expressing. You know, we, we love the fact where we say, um, you know, we all love the concept of love, but love looks like something and love actually takes action and it takes its effort and sometimes it's messy and sometimes it's not, it's not easy, but it is essential um, if we are to walk in this, in the apprentice of Jesus. So, you know, it might just very well just saying, hey, here's a meal. Here's some coffee and cake. Um, but before this can spread outside of the church, I believe it's got to start inside our churches. And so, you know, look, have a look around. Who haven't I had over in my house for a long time? Who can I start doing relationship with? You know, and the challenge is that we need to, I mean, and it's so simple, isn't it? Like what Jesus does is not this difficult thing. This is simple. This is something all of us can do. It's super easy. And even, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, if you're a single person, and you're like, oh, but I don't know who to invite. You know, invite a family. A family would love to, parents would probably love to have a night off, not cooking. And vice versa, families, if your family, invite some single people over. You know, kids love singles. You know, invite single people over. They like, they're amazing. Um, give them, that would, you know, sometimes we, we get worried, oh, but my house is messy. You know, it's not up to scratch. What are they going to think? Nobody really cares. But yet let's start doing life together. Um, and then once you do that, let's sit down. You, let's just start, hey, what's God doing in your life? How's your family? What can I pray for you? Why don't we pray tonight to, for, over something, you know, over needs that we have? Um, and let's just start asking questions and actually doing life like that. We have um, experienced this many times that the moment somebody comes into your home, something changes. Hasn't it? The moment you've shared a meal, it's like there's, so this like a breaking of ice and a breaking of um, just being vulnerable where you have allowed somebody into your home and it changes your relationship with that per that person. And so I believe that's what God wants us to be, where he wants us to be vulnerable, to go, hey, this is my house. This is who I am. This is, you know, what, this is where I hide often times, but I'm sick of hiding and I want to start doing life together. And so um, I want to encourage us to step out in this. Um, in the Spanish culture, which I'm from, or part in the European, I've got half Argentinian culture and half Slovak European culture. There's this great saying in the Argentine or in the Spanish culture, and it's "mi casa es su casa," and that means my house is your house. And they're very much like that, where they're like, "Hey, you know, my house is not perfect. It's not clean all the time. It's not tidy, but my house is your house. Come and make yourself at home. Open door, yeah, where you can just walk in." Whereas in the Australian, it's very different. It says, um, "A man's home is his castle." Have you heard that from the fa famous yeah, um, movie? But how different is that? And I believe one, one of those two things carries the heart of God. Because in a castle, what happens? You cannot just enter freely. In a castle or a castle, depending how you say it, um, you have to be invited. And yet that's kind of what, where we are at the moment, where you need to be invited to come to my home. You know, I freak out if somebody knocks on the door and I'm like, who's that? Did, did you invite somebody? We don't know someone's coming over. We got to start changing this. We really, really do. Because that is not what that's not how Jesus did life. Zacchaeus, he was up a tree and he said, hey, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house. Imagine if Zacchaeus said, oh, no, 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 sorry. It doesn't suit me right now. You know, this is not a good time. My house is a little bit messy. I don't know. I haven't gone grocery shopping. Um, and 
have you ever been to somebody's house where it doesn't matter what's on the table? You don't care if it's, if it's just a coffee with a couple of Arnott's biscuits. You really don't care. It's just the fellowship that we all crave. And I know that every person craves that. Every person craves belonging. Every person craves to be known and heard and listened. And yet this is something that's so simple that we can do. Um, so we start to need to, let's change it from my castle to mi casa es su casa, yeah? Come on over. Mark and I, we've been trying to do some of this. Where, and, you know, over Easter, that, you know, that's why we've rearranged even a few stuff here. So if you have a look, you know, we used to have um, the worship team on the, on the stage, on the platform, and we've kind of brought it all down here. So it's not an us and them. So it's not that this is raised and so that we are all equal. We've tried to kind of um, spread the chairs in a semicircle so we are facing each other. So we are doing more. Um, so our church is more like a family. Over Easter, it was great. We had the Passover. We had not a Passover meal, but we had dinner together on the Friday night. And that was, and we did worship. And, you know, you got to speak to whoever was in front of you and just share a little bit about your journey and where you're at. And um, then on the Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, we had breakfast together. Um, and it's just been so exciting to see that people forming relationships and people chatting and just people wanting to spend time like that. But it's got to go beyond the Sunday service. And that's another thing that I, I really believe. When I said, since when was it a Sunday service like that the pastors are serving? It's like a goods and services transaction. That was never the heart of Jesus. And so I think, why don't we change this to the Sunday gathering or the family gathering or the church gathering? Because that's what it is. It's not, hey, are you going to service? And that's what we've been saying for years. Hey, how was Sunday service? Because we take it as Someone is serving me. It's a service that they're providing. We need to change the way we speak. We need to change the way we start thinking. It's not a service. I'm not there. To, it's a gathering. It's a family gathering. It's a family meeting. And so if we start using language like that, will the culture change? I totally believe it will. And the way we view the Sunday morning gathering. But then let's extend it to not be either or, but to be both so that we Come Sunday morning, we get encouraged, we get fed, we hear the word, and then we start doing life together. There's this quote, and it says, In years to come, we are going to need many small communities which will welcome lost and lonely people, offering them a new form of family and a sense of belonging. In the past, Christians who wanted to follow Jesus opened up hospitals and schools. Now there are so many of these, Christians must commit themselves to new communities of welcome, to live with people who have no other family and to show them that they are loved and can grow to greater freedom and that they in turn can love and give life to others. Isn't that an amazing quote? That in the past, if you were a follower of Jesus, you would have to build hospitals and schools to show. Whereas now there's so many people who are so lonely that it's so... I don't want to build a hospital. It's too much work. <laughs> I can't build a school. That's too overwhelming for me. But I can open up my home and I can welcome someone into my family. And that is something that all of us can do. And so then in turn, it's a give and take, isn't it? That we show love and we receive love and then they can give love. If people come into our communities, into our family, at the living room family, and they get loved on, then they can go out and love others. That's how it works. And so the time has come for new... Com and just with that quote, um, guess when that was written? It was written in 1979. Oh my goodness, how much more? I mean, that sounds like it was just written just last week. And yet that was written in 1979. How much more applicable is it now more than ever? And so the time has come for new communities of welcome to start doing life together as a family. Let's start doing life as a family. You know, family sounds great, but it can get very messy and it can get very difficult and very hard and there's lots of humility. You've got to eat lots of humble pie. You've got to overlook you. There's got to be lots of grace given. But this is something that we can do because I know because it's the heart of the Father. It is the heart of the Father that the Christian communities are, are operating as families and are sharing together as families. So we are not against um, the corporate gathering. We love, we love it. 
Absolutely love coming to church on Sunday, you know. And if you're not here, why not? You know, we love having you um, part as we worship and you know do things corporately. But one or two hour is no, one or two hours on a week is nowhere near enough on its own. And so this should only work as a launching pad. We, it's a launching pad for the best stuff that will happen throughout the week in homes with groups of five and six and seven and ten people, and around a table. That's the heart of the Father. Um, so, you know, we know that with Jesus, um, this is not a commandment, you must, but if we are his apprentices, let's follow in his ways. Let's do what he asks us to do. In John 13, you know, you see Jesus practicing hospitality where he was with his, you know, disciples, he was having a meal. And so one minute he's hosting, he's having this meal and the next minute he's being a servant and he's wiping their feet. And yet that is what God is asking. And then he says, do this. Do this like I have done. You do it. And so we have a choice. Okay, am I going to do this? This week, God, give me the opportunity. Give me the courage to you know, just look around and go, who haven't I contact? Who haven't I had over for a long time? Who haven't I reached out to? Who can I have a meal with? Who can I catch up for coffee with? Trust me, I, 99 of the people you will ask will say, I would love to come. Occasionally you might get a rejection. It's a risk we need to take, yeah? But I'm sure that if you asked anybody, hey, I'd love to catch up for a meal, for a coffee, are you available? You know, me and Mark, we've been trying to catch up with people, but we can't meet everybody. We can't have, um, you know, I would be out every single night of the week. And sometimes, you know, we have done that three, four times a week, but we, that's not sustainable, you know, we, we have our kids as well that we need to focus on and there's, you know, other, there's nights that we just need to just go, okay, we're having a time of rest at home. But if each of us go, okay, once a week, I'm going to catch up with somebody over a meal. I'm going to open up my home. Um, I know the Father will add to our numbers daily and isn't that our desire? And then as we gather together, I can just envision this, yeah, as we gather together with our you know, with two or three families or one family. And then later on, we just start reaching out. Okay, let's reach out to non-believers. Who are our unbelieving friends who need to gather around a meal where we can just share what's going on in our life? Hey, church has been amazing. This is what's been going on. God has been so good. And we just start to share stories um, about the faithfulness and the love and the patience and, you know, um, just all the amazing things that God is doing in our lives. So let me just pray. And I want to ask that God will place somebody on your heart this week because oh, I don't want us just to be hearers of the word, but let's be doers of the word. And so that looks like something. That means putting action, which is so much easier just to sit back and go, yay, well, oh, that was a lovely message. I feel so inspired. No, we actually need to do something about this. And so um, as I pray, I'm just going to ask for God to drop someone into your spirit that's saying this week, and it may start, you know, with somebody who you are familiar with, but don't just stick to your close friends, those who I love, those who are like me. Yeah, oftentimes we want to hang out with people who are like me because it's just so much easier. But no, start stretching yourself. So start seeking, asking the heart of the Father. God, I oftentimes is God, who needs to be encouraged? Who do I need to spend time with? Who is feeling isolated or lonely that I need to spend time with them, that I need to reach out to them? And if you ask that, he will show you. And then it's your turn to start obeying and start preparing that meal. Prepare those sandwiches or whatever it may be. So if you're an awesome chef, yay for you. If you're like me and you just wing it a lot of times, that's okay too. But let's pray and I'm going to ask God to just really bless you. So Father God, thank you for this, um, for today. We thank you that your heart is for us to gather, not only in the temple, but also in around the table. And so help us to just be aware of what, you want us to do. So just right now, Father God, I ask that you will just drop into people's hearts a name or a person who you want them to fellowship with and share a meal. Father God, help us to be open to opening up our homes to each other and to loving on each other in that way. Jesus, we want to be your apprentices. And so thank you that you show us how to do this and that it's not difficult that it's not overwhelming, but it will just be a wonderful time that our, our homes 
become um, places of safety and refuge and of life together and of love. So speak to our hearts right now and show us what our part in all of this is. Thank you that you are faithful and thank you that as we practice this way, that as we start doing this, that you'll add to our numbers daily. We love you and thank you, Jesus, for showing us an awesome example of what that looks like. And we bless your name. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So I look forward to hearing lots of amazing stories of, um, you know, the wonderful times around the meals that you will share with people that you love and people maybe that you don't love so much, but that God has stretched your faith in. So God bless you. Have an amazing week. Bye. Love you guys.